Uh, my name is Emily Corbett Chadwick. I'm the current chair of PS21, which stands for Portsmouth Smart Growth for the 21st Century. Um, we're really excited to present this morning's speaker, um, Brent Totterin, um, and the topic of density done well and bringing that to New Hampshire. Uh, for those of you who don't know, because we're a little bit out of our geographic realm here, uh, Portsmouth Smart Growth for the 21st Century, or PS21, is an independent, volunteer-led nonprofit that presents ideas and encourages discussion around planning issues in Portsmouth and the Seacoast area. Our goal is to support a vibrant, sustainable, livable, and walkable community consistent with the principles of smart growth, the historic nature of Portsmouth, in the context of the 21st century. Um, and you can find out more about our work, um, information about PS21. Uh, we post videos of all of our speakers and events. Um, all of those are on our website, which is ps21.info. Um, and you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So typically, PS21 does events in the Portsmouth area, and part of our focus is to provide free um, and open events to the public. So this is a little bit outside of our typical realm, um, opening up the geographic area a little bit and um, specifically targeting more towards planning professionals and, and people in the, in the planning um, field. Uh, but we're, we were so excited to bring Brent here to talk. We really wanted to extend um, the impact of his, of his visit um, and we we're really excited to partner with New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority um, to um, bring the event to Concord today and to make it open to a wider audience. Um, so because we do all free and open uh, events, we rely on the generosity of sponsors and donations to bring in speakers like Brent, um, internationally known speakers that would be hard to bring in otherwise. Um, so we would like to thank our sponsors who made this event possible. Our lead sponsor for today is New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. We also had some additional event sponsors, Piscatas Piscataqua Savings Bank in Portsmouth, Old Port Properties, and the New Hampshire Planners Association. And we had help with the event from Plan New Hampshire, um, Seacoast Media Group, GDI Design, and the um, Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association. So I'm actually gonna hand it over to George Regan um, of the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. George is the Housing Awareness Program Administrator for New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. He works with regional workforce housing coalitions and municipalities around the state on local housing policy and its relation to community and economic development. Here you go, George, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, and good morning. Glad you all could make it this morning. Um, just wanted to, for those of you that aren't familiar with New Hampshire housing, um, just to let you know, we're a, we're a self-funded public benefit corporation. Um, our mission is to promote financial support, affordable housing throughout the state of New Hampshire, and really trying to you know, support other supports um, for low and moderate income families and, and households, um, and also really tie that connection of housing and economic development to the economic growth of New Hampshire. Um, and so we do that through a number of programs. We've got our home ownership programs, our tax credit programs that finances multifamily housing, assisted housing services, which helps with um, tenant vouchers, uh, rental assistance, um, and, and, and also our division that I'm in, education and advocacy, which is part of our policy plan and communications. And so that's where this to us really fits in. We've, um, we track, have a lot of data and look at, from a housing perspective, what's going on with, with economic development, the cost of housing, and a lot of times we understand that density is a key factor in at least providing a, an array of housing for those people and different wants and needs, and also that can be helpful in terms of affordability. So when we get an opportunity to bring someone like Brent into town, it seems like a real no-brainer to try to help support that. So uh, we're certainly thankful to PS21 and Doug Roberts, who, who knew, knew, knows Brent and wanted to bring him in, um, Robin LeBlanc and, and Plan New Hampshire as well for helping to get the word out. Um, we're, we're glad that you were here in Portsmouth the other night. I understand you were in New Hampshire in the 90s in Dover, which is where I live, and also in Portsmouth. So it's great that you've got some perspective. And he did a little walking tour here in Concord this morning before he came into this theater. So we're very happy to have him. We're really excited for the program. It's going to be about an hour and a half. He'll do about an hour. We'll do some Q&A, and we'll talk more about that. Um, and then we'll be able to meet in the lobby afterwards to have some time to talk with Brent. So there's some opportunity there. Um, I know that the word density, from our perspective, we're maybe sometimes are asked to use different words. I think it's, we should be able to embrace it and be, be bold. Um, and I'm thinking of even having a hashtag, hashtag you are my density. And maybe that would be something <laughs> um, that will work well because there's certainly a lot of negative connotations. So I'm looking forward to his conversation about that and what that means in community 
um, development and, and just developing our, our small towns here and, and larger urban areas. So with that, um, let me just give you a, a few seconds about Brent. Um, <clears throat> internationally known planner Brent Tottering, a passionate practitioner and advocate for creative, vibrant city building. A practitioner and thought leader with over 25 years of experience in advanced urbanism, city planning, and urban design. Tottering has advised and collaborated with cities, agencies, and best practice developers around the world. Um, he's also a founding president of the Council for Canadian Urbanism and writes for numerous um, publications including Huffington, Huffington Post, City Lab, Spacing, and Planetizen. And with that, welcome Brett. Thank you. Thanks very much. I did have a chance to um, look around Concord only a little bit, um, just, just basically walking your main street. And um, so I, I, unfortunately, I, I like to be in a place and absorb as much as I can about it before I try to connect the dots. But I also know that many of you folks aren't necessarily just from Concord, right? You, this is an audience from lots of different places. So um, I'll say that my only two quick observations is clearly there's been investment in the streetscape quality here, which is very positive. You have a more um, fine-grained and rigorous wayfinding system than any place I've ever seen on planet Earth. Literally every block, and even in some cases a half block, it's telling me how many minutes it will still take for me to get to the next intersection. Uh, I love wayfinding, but man, that's, that's, that's a lot. But good on you for, for, for caring about an important issue like wayfinding. So I'm nothing but complimentary. Um, how many of you, raise your hand if you're a, a city or town planner. Raise your hand if you're an architect. Engineer? What else? Realtor. 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 Construction? Landscape, Landscape architect. Sorry to leave you out. I should, have, I should have included the third of the triumvirate of, of design professions. Yes, but I know better. I'm the, I'm the president of the Council for Canadian Urbanism, and we have, it was originally brought together by those three disciplines, so bad on me. Um, any politicians elected? Nice to see you again, Councillor. Um, that's helpful. Uh, so mostly planners. Um, raise your hand if you're public sector. So private sector? So this is a public sector crowd. OK, that's good to know, too. It won't necessarily change what I say or how I say it, but uh, it's good for me to know. Um, I tend to say the same things no matter. Well, no, that's not true. I vary my audience based on what I think uh, will resonate. and and. What I'd say to you to start is, is I have no idea in this crowd of, of professionals if the things I'm going to tell you are, uh, w reflect w what's usually called preaching to the converted, or if some of you would uh, debate with me on some of the things I would say. Certainly I'm going to talk about issues of density where I have no doubt there would be debates about uh, density in the context of at least uh, uh, intensity of density uh, and scale of density and height of density, which is often the most controversial issue. But what I like to say is that even if you completely agree with everything I say, my actual, I don't have a problem with that. My actual task is not necessarily to tell you things you don't already know or understand. And I actually hope you believe everything and agree with everything I say. But what I've learned is that uh, uh, knowing the right thing to do is the easy part. <coughs> Being more persuasive, understanding how to get it done is the hard part. And I've spent my entire career trying to figure out how to communicate these things in a way that frankly is more politically persuasive, breaks through the media noise, et cetera. And uh, given that there's many government folks uh, in the audience, I'll say even more candidly, how to say it in a way that isn't mind-numbingly boring. Because we have a tendency to take an inherently interesting thing, like how we build cities and towns, and make people want to just shut their heads off uh, because we're so boring about it. And so hopefully you won't find this boring because this is uh, my attempts to show that we can be hopefully a lot more persuasive in how we talk about these kinds of things. The only thing that was left out in my bio is I did, I've, I'm 26 years in, about 14 of that in the, is in the private sector, six years at, uh, in leadership at the city of Calgary uh, in Canada and six years as chief planner of Vancouver, Canada. So everything I say uh, is not naive to the challenges of how government works. Uh, and yet, um, when I was in government, I almost routinely ignored the advice about 
how I was supposed to behave while I was in government. And that's usually been the key to my successes in, in government. So I'm absolutely convinced we can be better, more effective, more persuasive while in government. And I don't let the fact that we're in government be an excuse for not getting it done. I want to address an under, elephant under the table. I did this in my public lecture last night because I was thinking about how I would be perceived here in this place um, that is very different from certainly where I planned as, as chief planner of Vancouver. So yes, this is where I spent six of my 26 years planning. Uh, very different in terms of uh, natural context, beauty, density, intensity. This is the downtown, not the whole city of Vancouver, but this is usually what Vancouver gets attention around. As you can see, uh, in the past we were referred to as a setting in search of a city and then our city building value system started to be described as trying to build a city that was worthy of that setting and you can see the quality of the setting uh, for our city. But as you well know, many places have squandered or even damaged uh, their connection to their setting in the context of bad or lazy city making. Uh, but this is also Vancouver. Um, I know many of you work in heritage places, low scale places. This is our original town site for Vancouver Gastown, National Heritage District, uh, low scale. And we've actually used density in other parts of the city to pay for the preservation and restoration of this community uh, through uh, uh, tools like heritage density transfers and what we call the density bank. So ironically, we use density to preserve the heritage and scale that you are struggling in many cases to preserve in some of your contexts because we started off with a much weaker heritage protection system than probably most of you actually have. British Columbia has some of the weakest heritage uh, protection legislation in North America. And yet we've accomplished things by strategically using a tool like density to actually not just protect it, because that's the easy part, restoring it, and, and in a Vancouver context, seismically upgrading it so that we can survive earthquakes uh, has been the hard part. So we've had to think creatively in our heritage planning. And if you think um, I only work for big cities, I've probably worked for more small towns and, and medium-sized cities than I have big cities in my 26 years and particularly in my consulting practice. This is a city in Canada that I just started working for, uh, which is just down the road from where I was born, uh, called Kingston, Ontario, original capital of Canada before Ottawa became uh, it. Incredibly strong heritage preservation mindset, incredibly tense density and height conversations, polarizing debates, uh, aggressive politics. Does that sound familiar to, to any of you? Um, and I spent my first week with them a, a, a month ago and I've been, spent a lot of my time on Skype with them since, advising them on all sorts of things. And this is probably one of about a hundred cities of this kind of scale and vintage that I've worked for. And this is where I was born, Perth, Ontario, population 6,000. The queen, our queen, not yours. I know you guys like the royals lately, but <laughs> the, there are royals, not yours. You rejected them. Um, I'm kind of kidding. Uh, the Queen called it the prettiest town in North America, uh, one of the most uh, coherent heritage main streets anywhere. Uh, and this is where I learned my sense of city making before I moved to the big city. Now I tell you these things not to brag, but because you know this kind of context plus the hundreds of similar towns and cities I've worked in Heck, I was even uh, certified by the National Main Street Center in the National Trust for Historic Preservation as a certified Main Street manager in the 90s. I tell you all that because you don't get to write me off as a guy who comes from Vancouver or just does tall buildings. And I say that because I'm used to people in the audience trying to frame me that way and thus diminish or attack the credibility of my argument. So you don't get to do that. Are, are we agreed on that? All right. This was the view from uh, my hotel window in Portsmouth. And I tweeted about it. And I said, uh, reminded me why I was keen to come back to Portsmouth. Uh, but if my hotel room had been on the other side of the hotel, I wouldn't have been as complimentary because that's where the new stuff was happening in the north end of Portsmouth. And the truth is we're inheriting decisions and architecture and built form the, from the past, but the modern decisions around city making in some of these places is not particularly good, and particularly in terms of how density is done. Portsmouth, and, I'm, and I know, how many of you are from Portsmouth? Okay. 
Um, I know most of you aren't, and, but I didn't have pictures of other places, so I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly a lot going for it in terms of uh, uh, an inherently walkable, beautiful, historic downtown. And yet, um, I actually am showing uh, complementary pictures because I noted all the places where the roads were too wide, the sidewalks are too thin, there's no room for walking effectively. If two strollers had to pass, uh, I'm confident it couldn't be done. Lots of space for parking. I hear you folks in places like New Hampshire, the most auto-dependent um, uh, parts of the United States. I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, and there's an irony to that, given the historic beauty you've uh, uh, inherited. So you have a lot of assets. I'm not fully sure you're taking advantage of them uh, in terms of making strategic decision making. And then, of course, you've done stupid, awful things like other places have done, uh, usually in the context of, of supporting that habit of uh, car dependency. Uh, we even talked about, I, I'm, I'm cutting my Portsmouth slide short from last night, but we talked about some uh, specific contentious issues like the need to preserve the, herit uh, the, um, the heritage, it is a heritage, federal heritage building. Um, granted to the city of Portsmouth as long as it's not torn down. I, I think I was controversial with the audience last night because I said I thought it wasn't that bad. Uh, I think it's a, an interesting building, certainly in terms of buildings that were built in that era. And there's a lot of things that could be done in terms of an at-grade restaurant with patios coming out into the arcade to activate the space. So, you know, I think some of the locals really wanted me to hate this thing. I could tell by their narrative, but I... I I um, probably rubbed them the wrong way by saying it was not that bad. But the other part of the same building that also has heritage status for some reason I don't understand is what really confused me. Like, why that? <laughs> I, I cannot uh, think of a reason why you'd want to preserve that. And that's your opportunity to do something else from a public realm perspective or an intensive uh, uh, infill perspective, etc. So we had some fun, as you can imagine, yesterday. Um, and I said a lot of things that hopefully got people wiggling in their seats uncomfortably. But it was a pretty um, um, uh, fun exercise. When I'm talking about density and city making, and boy is my sense that this conversation is lacking, certainly in Portsmouth, I'm immediately seeking to connect the dots to the large societal issues that are directly related to how we are building our cities and our mobility. We seem to have this very superficial conversation, particularly about the effects of decisions. You know, when you're talking about height and density, it's like, what do I feel like and what's the, what's, what's, what makes me feel comfortable or not? I respect that, but let's not lose sight of the actual things we're trying to address, from climate change to public health, epidemics related to preventable diseases that are directly tied to how we plan and design cities, and particularly suburbs. Housing affordability related to supply, workforce housing boy in Portsmouth, sure an issue in terms of not only uh, the affordability issues related to supply, but the location of housing or lack thereof of location of housing relative to, uh, to workplaces, which makes it more car dependent and, and thus more expensive. Uh, unpredictable energy costs, I used to say rising energy costs, but then they lowered and the point is they're unpredictable. And we can't necessarily count on them when we're doing things like even talking about congestion charging. Uh, aging and changing population and all this while trying to maintain an individual character of places and not just replicate and copy and look like every other place. So all sorts of challenges with smarter city making being the crux of the solution. And yet we tend to have a really simplistic conversation about issues like density. So you need to take, I, I, I'm glad to hear apparently that in New England uh, climate change is taken seriously, that when the flooding happened just a few days ago, there was conversation about the implications of sea level rise and storm events and surge events and moon tides and such. Are, are, it's understood that it's related to climate change. My observation that United States was slow in, in that conversation, but Hurricane Sandy was a game changer, and I noticed that I could have easier conversations when I came to the United States after Sandy, and at least until you elected your current president um, uh, in that context, which has dumbed down the conversation. But luckily, cities and states seem to still understand it, if you're not in Florida. If you're not motivated by climate science, which you should, the doctors and the public health care officials are incredibly persuasive, probably the most persuasive allies we have as city makers. Because I li like to joke, and it's not really a joke, that we may not listen to our climate scientists, but we're used to listening to our doctors. And 
in this case, in around the Toronto area, the four public health care uh, uh, officials, public health officials in four regions, including and around Toronto, held a joint press conference to talk about transit, walking and biking, and community design. And they got a ton of press all over Canada. And uh, uh, if the four chief planners of those counties had called a press conference, no media probably would have come. But the doctors get the attention. And in Australia, as another example, I'm working a lot in Australia and New Zealand, and one of my biggest clients in Australia bringing me in to help cities and state planning agencies understand how to do better healthy city planning is the Heart Foundation of Australia who are, rather than doing the things they normally do, are bringing in urbanists like me to come in and change the minds of cities and state governments to build better cities and communities. That's actually pretty remarkable if you think about it. And this document, by the way, is online. You can download it. Does density matter? It's excellent. You should read it. But I'll give away the ending. Yes, density matters. And it matters a lot. And they know that. So think about that. Public health care officials talking about the D word. And if climate change and public health epidemics, uh, including public health cost uh, epidemics, uh, don't influence you, then money often does. Canada is in the lead, as in North America, certainly in uh, doing the math of sprawl versus infill, the co relative costs in terms of infrastructure and all the other extended costs. Uh, about uh, just changing the dial on how much of your growth, what percentage of your growth goes to infill versus greenfield. And it's remarkable. And when they, that math shows up on the front page, sprawl could cost an extra $3 billion for municipal services over the life of a plan. That gets politicians' attention, whether you're so-called right-wing or left-wing. It really makes the point, especially if you're claiming to be fiscally conservative, that there's a smarter, dumb way to do this. And I'm finding that math is one of the biggest game changers. Cities, suburbs, and towns are changing their conversations about city making faster than I've ever observed in my 26 years. Not because we've suddenly gotten better at the ideology arguments, but because we're doing the math. And we're not even doing the full math yet. Not full cost, life cycle cost math. Even the superficial math is shocking in terms of the actual money. Which is why many governments are outlawing math uh, lately, because it's, it's inconvenient. You can't unring this bell once you know this. You can't unknow it. And if you think that technology is going to save us, because the great distraction lately is, well, don't worry, Brent. I've actually had mayors say to me, don't worry, Brent. But within the life of this conversation, we're all going to be in automated cars anyway, as if that's not going to actually make things worse, which is entirely possible it will, depending on whether uh, automated cars are shared ownership or individual ownership. I can get into that in large detail, but that is the most important distinction in the evolution of automated vehicles. But the point is that this will not save us if we're still doing the fundamentals wrong, if we're not still planning our cities and our suburbs stupidly. I often joke, this is the kind of tech I like. Wheeled luggage and trolley carts that show you that you can uh, walk to your grocery store. If technology isn't going to save us, demographics might. The millennials, which is net, was the second large and is largest and is now the largest demographic group in human history, uh, on planet Earth, second largest in human history after the boomers, who have started to pass away. Uh, we all know that they think entirely differently than any previous generation. Not as much as the media points out. Not all millennials are foregoing their driver's license, but about half of them are. And that's a much bigger percent than any previous generation in terms of wanting walkable, bikeable, transit-friendly urban communities if they can afford it and if it's available. They'll go to the suburbs if they have to, but they don't want that. They don't prefer it. Unless we can do suburbs in a more multimodal and walkable way, which is of interest to millennials. Again, at least half of them. The other half of them want the white picket fence that they grew up in. But you can't underestimate half, the, the interest of half of the largest demographic group on planet Earth. And their parents, the former number one, uh, are increasingly wanting urban conditions too. And I, the, when I first started using this slide, I once had a, a, a senior woman accuse me of being senior shaming by using this term, broken hipsters. Um, 
I, I meant it out of no disrespect. It's not my term, it's the Wall Street Journals. But I liked it because it's making the point that seniors are acting in a way that we equate lazily with hipsters. They want urban places, they want walkable places. They don't, why? It's not that hard. They don't want to be car dependent, they want to be more active, and mainly they want to live near their kids and grandkids. They don't want to be in seniors' enclaves. And because their kids and grandkids want to live in urban places, so do they. And these two largest demographic groups on planet Earth are fighting over a, a really relatively small amount of the real estate market because we're not building this enough. And the boomers are winning because they have all the money. So why, if the two largest demographic groups in human history are shown to want this, aren't we doing more to build it? What's our excuse? And even the demographic group in between, the age groups that are having families, the narrative is usually, well, they're not interested in urban places. They want su the suburbs and the, um, the 2.5 cars on average. What we find uh, in urban places, certainly what we found in Vancouver, is that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're not interested in urban places because we've designed urban places to virtually repel families. Anytime you've actually designed urban places to accommodate and welcome families, it works. Vancouver has 7,000 children in the downtown peninsula, that image that I showed you, 7,000, which is about 6,800 more than we had a few decades ago in the downtown. By deliberate strategy, by deliberate design, mandating, regulating, I know that's a bad word in, in parts of the United States, but regulating a percent of two and three bedroom units in all projects to make sure you have housing that actually fits families, using tools like density bonusing, et cetera, to get the daycare and the schools that they actually need, urban schools. In downtown Vancouver, you can't swing a stick without hitting a daycare center. And we just opened our second downtown elementary school, a four-story vertical urban elementary school. In the work I'm doing in Australia, they're building eight-story urban high schools. And, and, and they're even more urban than what we're doing in Vancouver. So they're building the infrastructure. And then when they design the public realm, they design it with a kid's first lens. Because as we say in Vancouver, if it works for kids and parents, it works for everyone. So this is not an exaggerated photo. Look how many kids are in that image. You know, in the common narrative, when you have one kid, you feel the pressure to move to the suburbs. There's four saying that downtown living is great. I live downtown Vancouver. We're about to have our second. And people keep saying, so you're going to buy a car now, right? You're going to move to the suburbs. We got rid of our car in 2009 because our neighborhood makes owning a car kind of stupid. It's about the neighborhood. It's not about the ideology. So even the demographic group in between uh, will be predisposed to urban places if we actually start designing them for families. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Don't let anyone ever tell you that families don't want to be in urban places. That's an uninformed opinion. Notwithstanding what I'm saying, I, I, I like to, um, early in my talk, make this point. At some point in my talk, most of you will be thinking what I call the eight most unhelpful words in the English language, which is, we can never do that in our city. I'm sure you've already started thinking that. I certainly got that in Portsmouth yesterday. We can't do what you're talking about because fill in the blank. There's a remarkable amount of energy that goes into excuse. And what I find around the world is that the cities that I'm working with that are doing it are the ones that don't have a more favorable climate or topography or political position or political leader. They're the ones that are not using those things as an excuse and they're just finding the way to get it done. Including, I, I advised Medellin, Medellin, Colombia, Medellin, Colombia for two years after leaving City Hall. This was the city that was the in the 1990s, the murder capital of the world. And it wasn't even close. Their, their murder rates were, were, were much higher than even number two. This was Pablo Escobar. This is, if you watch the Netflix series Narco, you understand Medellin, uh, or you did in 1990s. Now it's called the Medellin, or Medellin. I say those both, the locals call it Medellin, um, the Medellin miracle, uh, which is the transformation of the city to, from the murder capital of the world to what the Wall Street Journal called the, the most innovative city in the world. Uh, just a couple of years ago. Particularly a transformation in transportation, 
uh, bus only lanes, rapid transit, and even repurposing cable cars from the ski slopes because the governor went skiing and thought, why not? Um, when you've got that kind of topography, uh, it certainly makes a lot of sense. But other cities, you know, in Vancouver, we've dithered over a, a gondola for about 40 years. Well, maybe that's an exaggeration, probably about 25 years. Uh, whereas they did it within a few years. And even repurposing escalators to facilitate in the poorest communities. This is Comuna Treze, one of the poorest in, in Medellin. Um, in order to facilitate a walkable city, a city for people, a city for life. So it's remarkable how they used to be afraid of the streets because they would literally be killed by uh, gunfire or murder. Uh, now they've taken back their spaces and have created new spaces because they've sort of embraced civic life. They've taken back their city. But even them, when they first called me, uh, one of the things they wanted me to help them with was enhancing pedestrianism, uh, uh, particularly because there was still a perception that that was unsafe. But it wasn't unsafe because of gunfire, it was unsafe because of cars. And they didn't think they'd have the will to actually push back against car culture. Even the city that had pushed back against Pablo Escobar didn't think they could face car culture down. At least that's what they thought, but they are doing it now. I made that point to them in the media, in, in a big media scrum. Surely you're telling me the city that defeated Pablo Escobar isn't afraid of the car lobby. The cities that are doing it, the states and governments that are doing it, are the ones that are getting past excuse and they're focusing on these key things. A clear vision of what they want, sometimes out of desperation like Medellin or just an understanding of the lost opportunities. And the will, skill and follow through to actually get it done. Because we're really good at talking in North America. Latin America gets things done and they get it done fast and they get it done cheap. Much smarter than us. When you're talking about densification, especially in communities, uh, we have to change the reasons why we're even talking about density. In Portsmouth, uh, it was all about tax base, I, I noticed in the context of the last bit. Which is right, but it's not necessarily the best even, and certainly not the only reason you talk about density. I created this slide while I was chief planner of Vancouver, so I could go from community to community to talk about why the planning department of City Hall is even talking about density at all. Because the narrative often, even in places like Vancouver, is if you're talking about density, it must be because developers want to make more profit. Because that's the only reason to do density. And if a planner is talking about density, then the planner must be in the pocket of the developer. I've got, if I had a dime for every time, that's been uh, uh, said of me. But we talk about density because you can't have a serious conversation about reducing energy use and that's, thus GHG emissions without density. You can't really get to active transport being even manageable, let alone delightful, without talking about density. More green design options, many of which are only possible with minimum levels of density, like district energy and geothermal. You guys seem to lack a, a conversation about green design here, um, from what I've at least seen. Maybe some of the architects might debate with me on that, but I'd be glad to debate with you about that. Certainly less pressure for sprawl. Somebody asked me last night how we do density in the context of preserving wetlands and rivers, and I'd say you stay away from wetlands and rivers by building more densely and stop expanding out where you're running into wetlands and rivers. So it's pressure for sp less pressure for sprawl on agricultural land, natural lands, etc. Certainly more affordable housing choices, um, not necessarily affordability, but a density is a precondition for affordable housing choices. Improved public health, vitality, diversity, safety, almost any way you, you can measure, density, if it's done well, outperforms. And these are all public interest reasons that have nothing to do with de developer density. Or even something as simplistic as the city wanting to increase its tax base, which comes across as a really crass reason to citizens who are worried about the loss of quality of life. So you need to be talking about the public interest reasons. I like to talk about what I call the evolution, the four-step process uh, towards doing things right. We start off by doing the wrong thing. We've been doing that a lot since the 1960s in terms of planning and design and architecture. Then after Herculean efforts, we get to the point where we're doing the wrong thing better. I've certainly seen examples of that in Portsmouth over the last while. A quick example would be you widen your, side, you widen your road, uh, but you put in a bike lane next to it. Um, that nobody will use because it doesn't connect between anything and anything. 
or you have a, a you build more suburban shopping centers that you don't need but you have a good landscape plan so there's more trees in the parking lot that's doing the wrong thing better and I commented last night that I'm enough of a pragmatist that I would say if you're going to do the wrong thing you might as well do it better so I will give some credit for that but I will be very quick to point out that don't for a second mistake that for actually doing the right thing and you've got to be really candid about that and have a conversation about how to get to the right thing, get past uh, doing the wrong thing better. It'd be great if you could jump from one to four, but sometimes you have to go through two and three to get to four. I added in three when working in cities like Denver and Brisbane, Australia, because they were uh, putting in transit lanes, investing in cycle infrastructure, but at the same time as they were often tying that funding to a bond measure to widen the, the highway at the same time because they thought that's the only way they could get it politically passed. That's doing the wrong, th or that's how trying to have your cake in it too, uh, and eating it too. That's why you end up wondering why nobody's, why there isn't mode shift and car uh, mode share is actually still going up even though you've invested in transit. Well, that's why. It's just as important that you stop doing the wrong things as it is starting to do the right things. And then eventually you might be doing the right thing. And then you can have a conversation about doing the right thing better because there are grades of that. But you know, you have to sometimes go through these steps and it's important to be candid. I ask you in the context of your individual places and you can do this on an issue by issue basis. Where are you? You know, often people say to me, they tweet, they, they take a picture of that and they tweet it and they say, I think my city is in number three. Uh, what I say is that your city's probably in all four, or town is in all four, but you might be in a lot more in one than you are in four, with a fair chunk of two and three, right? So the point is, you can do it on almost an issue by issue basis. But here's the point, progress doesn't just depend on starting doing the right things, it depends on stopping doing the wrong things, and even going back and fixing your mistakes. And I make that distinction because often stopping doing the wrong things is harder politically for politicians than doing the right things. I've seen city after city start to invest and get applause from the progressives in, in, in the city uh, for starting to do the right things. But when the moment comes to say no to the wrong thing, not enough people are applauding that. So um, it's really hard when a developer is pushing or a, or a, 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 a car-oriented lobby is pressuring you keep doing the wrong thing too. So you gotta have that conversation in a candid sense. Thank you. So yes, I, I do talk about Vancouver and I know it's different from many of the contexts you uh, work in, but I do it not to brag, but to make the point that everything I talk about is not a part of this false choice about whether we're gonna do good smart planning and design or be open for business. I won't ask you to raise your hands if you come from a place where your city uses that line, your politicians use that line. We all know a lot of them do. And it's usually a false choice because what I find is that the city that's doing this well are creating value. These are all just some of the accolades that Vancouver gets related to how we build the city. So, and the most important one is down at the bottom if you're in a fiscally conservative place. It's about economic success. It's about value creation. I created this slide for the mayor of Sydney, Australia, because she was struggling with the perception that density, oh, sorry, uh, design was about aesthetics. And so we had a whole conversation with the community about how design is about value creation. Just about every way you can do the math, in a lot of ways you can't count, good design has a track record of return on investment, actual success. And, and I'm not going to go through these, so if you're really interested, snap a picture of it really quick. But the point is that we need to have, if your levers for your politicians to be more persuasive is about a business case, man, is there ever a business case for good design. And if they think good design is the thing that's kind of nice to have if you have money left over in the budget, you're leaving a lot of money on the, on the table. You don't understand value creation. Most of the cities that are having that kind of a false choice are the unsuccessful cities that actually don't have the confidence to create lasting value. I hate to be that blunt, but that's the truth. Putting it more simply, beauty outperforms ugly, and it's remarkable how expensive ugly can be. 
So this is the rest of Vancouver. We get a lot of attention for the downtown, but as you can see, there's a lot of context that is more analogous to probably to some of the places that you're planning. But we're densifying all of those contexts, not in a one-size-fits-all approach or a lazy approach, but a contextual density conversation about what different levels of density can do in different places, especially ground-oriented density, and I'll get to that near the end. But then once you get out of the city, you get into the sprawl. And this is one of the biggest things that needs to be discussed candidly. I don't know, I got a sense of Portsmouth sprawl. I don't know uh, from your perspective if you actually have residential sprawl. I assume you do because you live in North America and every place has sprawl. And that's where most North Americans live. Not in cities, but in suburbs. And that's still where most North Americans are going. And I'm not one of those urbanists that, that, that uh, attacks the concept of a suburb. But what I do say is the success or failure of our city regions and ultimately in the context of climate change and public health, our survival depends on how well we do our suburbs. We can do our inner cities and our downtowns almost perfectly and still fail, profoundly fail, if we don't think that everything I'm talking about relates to the suburbs. Not all suburbia sprawl. I don't use those two terms interchangeably. A lot of urbanists do. I think that's lazy. But too much of it is, let's be candid. And the key, I don't believe in big, complex definitions of sprawl. Sprawl is auto-dependency. If you're auto-dependent, you're sprawl. If you actually have reasonable choices that aren't just taken by people who have no other choice, and you're suburban, then you're then you're a suburb, but you're not necessarily sprawl. And then you can have a conversation about whether you want to urbanize, but I don't try to ban suburbs, but I think we need to ban sprawl. That's sprawl in the simplest sense of it. And you need to be able to have that conversation. Just like you need to be able to say the word density, you need to be able to say the word sprawl. I know some politicians who say, oh Brent, we don't have sprawl here because we plan all our suburbs. And sprawl is unplanned. Of course you can plan sprawl. In most of North America, it's legally mandated. So of course you can plan sprawl. We need to have that conversation. In Vancouver, our suburbs are urbanizing. This is a 1960s shopping center with the sea of parking, the standard kind of thing. But as you can see, transit investment goes in. Doesn't need to be high order transit like our SkyTrain system. It can be bus, uh, express bus. It can be just frequency bus that actually has the frequency to be predictable. And you get these kinds of transformations that we're doing. Don't be distracted by tall buildings. I'm going to say this to you over and over again. Don't be distracted by how tall the building is. Look at the urbanism. Uh, you can get a, a remarkable amount of transformation in a relatively small area. The, where's, where's my pointer? Here we go. So all of this you see in the foreground. That's almost finished construction in this particular station. My wife is the planner. Uh, working on this in, in the municipality next to Vancouver. All of that, except for these ghosted in secondary, second phase towers, hasn't even touched the shopping mall yet. It's all in the parking, which shows you how remarkably we've wasted space in this context. And then the phase two is actually going to be above where the existing shopping center is. I'm sure you have this scenario in your cities and towns. I'm sure you do. And then when you're doing transit corridors, it doesn't have to be tall buildings, it can be mid-rise. This is our Canby corridor that uh, runs along what we call the Canada Line, which was the line we built in time for the 2010 Winter Olympics that we hosted to connect the downtown to the airport. And we're doing mid-rise urbanism, uh, six-story uh, and then higher at the station areas. But you can do all sorts of different kinds of scales along a, an entire corridor that doesn't have to necessarily be about high rise, but it should create body heat for transit ridership and be enough of a critical mass to actually create walking, biking relationships, live work relationships, so you don't even need to just take transit. I don't even call this stuff transit oriented development. I just call it good urbanism because you actually want to walk, bike and take transit, not just default to transit. I'll get into that more. I looked at, look for examples in Portsmouth. This is a residential project uh, next to a shopping mall right here um, uh, in the ex outskirts of Portland. And this, they call this a tall building there. Maybe you call that a tall building from where you're from too. I've, I call it mid-rise. Uh, but 
I asked why not a tower there, uh, a 12-story even tower or something for more body heat for, to, to have the relationship with the shopping. There's no one who would complain, and then the crowd laughed at me when I say that, because I looked at what's next door, and it's that and that. So uh, why would there be a complaint? And they laughed at me. But I, uh, my answer to them was, well, just because they complain doesn't make them right. And why not have a conversation about height? The answer is because we don't do taller buildings in Portsmouth. That's not a planning answer. When I talked, oh, sorry, that, that's an extra slide. When we talked about density in Vancouver, we've been talking about it for years, and it's not easy. If you think it's easy in Vancouver, you're wrong. Uh, we did an exercise while I was chief planner called Eco Density, which was a, a two year process to change all of our thinking and all of our uh, uh, rules and regulations around ecological uh, density as the key to lowering our ecological footprint. One of the advisors I had was actually the co-creator of the concept of ecological footprint, Dr. William Rees, who teaches in, at UBC, University of British Columbia. And so we had a very strong scientific base for using density to be more green. Uh, because even in Vancouver, there were some people who said, well, density is not green. It's like crowded and dusty and smoky. It's not green. Well, of course it's green. It's incredibly green. Uh, this is one of the slides I used that ended up on the front page of the paper. Greenhouse gas emissions per capita per, per, or per person, tons. Uh, 1.5 tons per person in the downtown that I showed you. In the next round of inner city, three tons. Up to six tons per person in the rest of the city and nine to 12 out in the region. Climate scientists will tell you we can generate, on, on, based on our populations, no more than 1.8 tons per person to not be uh, accelerating climate change. So the message was Vancouverites are contributing to climate change. You know, I joked, unless you live downtown, and that's only true if you're not flying anywhere like I do. So that got Vancouverites' attention because Vancouverites think of themselves as green, as really caring about climate change. So this was the burning platform. This was the conversation starter about why we need to have a different conversation about density. And man, was it ever a tough conversation. The D word is not an easy conversation. And I got a lot of pressure to use a different word, Brent, a less controversial word. How about choice? Choice is not a synonym for density. It doesn't work. You have to be honest and have the tough conversations. And it was tough. We had, a, we had six nights of public hearing when we brought the final plan. Uh, and it was jam-packed, speaker after speaker, for six nights in a row. Uh, but um, more people were supportive than not. All the professionals, uh, from affordability to green design and sustainability, were, were very supportive. And ultimately, a council that was split when we started and barely got a 6-5 vote to initiate the plan, unanimously supported it. You can have a c tough conversation about density and succeed if, frankly, you do a better job of it. And again, if you think this is easy in Vancouver, I guarantee you the activists in Vancouver uh, that talk about density are tougher than yours. Because we've actually educated them through all of our processes to be incredibly uh, intelligent critics of how uh, Vancouver does its city making. And I like to point often that one of the toughest critics on density is actually the youngest son of Jane Jacobs, who co-wrote Dark Age Ahead with her, Ned Jacobs. And you haven't had a tough conversation about density t until you're debating what Jane meant with her son. So don't think it's easy in Vancouver and hard where you are. That's another excuse. So how am I doing? Thank you. So I'm going to run through uh, relatively quickly, the three keys to density done well, the subject matter that you need to be having a conversation about. The first and most important, in my opinion, is land use and mov movement, mobility, transportation aligned. One conversation, city making conversation. I don't need to tell you that most governments, the conversations between transportation and land use are not aligned. They sometimes barely even talk to each other. In some cases, they're in outright warfare with each other. Uh, and usually the transportation engineers win is what I've found, certainly in the United States. Not true in Vancouver, but certainly in, in, in many cities. The most important thing to remember is this, which I hope uh, everyone knows by now. Certainly people like me are out there 
talking about it an awful lot, and the media is understanding and picking it up when they're not being influenced by their car manufacturing uh, advertisers. Uh, bigger roads actually make traffic worse. It's the law of congestion, induced traffic or induced demand. If you don't understand this yet, look it up. But the point is that in a relatively short order, if you widen roads or build new freeways, you induce more driving and they fill up. Uh, more roads never solves congestion unless you have some other factor like a closed plant, factory plant or, or a lack of actual origin and destination demand. The only city I've ever worked in where this isn't true is Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I worked in a few years ago, where you can shoot a cannon down some of the streets and not hit a car because they so overbuilt their streets and their surface parking that they wiped out a lot of the reasons to come downtown. But in most normal functioning or successfully functioning places, this is true. You can't build uh, your way out of congestion with wider roads. We've known it since 1955. The great Lewis Mumford said adding highway lanes to deal with traffic congestion is like loosening your belt to cure obesity. No one's said it better than that since 1955, and yet our transportation industry has done their best to pretend they don't know it for a long time. Because in many cases, it's not politically popular to say this, because ribbon cuttings for new road projects are like candy to politicians. So uh, it needs to be told that those kinds of uh, ribbon cuttings are wasteful, expensive, and they don't work. Unless your actual goal is to induce sprawl, in which case they do work. We say in Vancouver, the best transportation plan is a great land use plan. And it's not just the planners that say this, it's the engineers. We have a different kind of engineer in Vancouver. Um, by design over years. In other words, if you get your land use right, then the transportation isn't necessarily easy, but it's a heck of a lot easier than if you try to do walking, biking, and transit ridership shift, uh, and you've gotten your land use fundamentally wrong. I hopefully don't need to tell you that, but the, the, the distinction of that is super important. Our, our transportation engineers are constantly pointing out that our success in mode shift in Vancouver, which is remarkable, by North American standards. I have to point that out because I work in Northern Europe and places like that, where they kind of laugh politely at our mode shift uh, successes in Vancouver. We're the first city in North America to get to double digits of cycling mode shift, 10% of all trips by bike, which in North America is, is remarkable, and it kind of gets polite applause uh, in Copenhagen, as you can imagine, or Groningen. I work for Groningen, Netherlands, which is the bike capital of the planet. Uh, but it's a big deal in North America, and it's because of land use initially. And then you've got to build the infrastructure. Don't get me wrong, infra infrastructure is incredibly important. But if you had got the land use wrong in the first place, I won't say that infrastructure is useless. It's just, let's, let's be honest and say you're going to be limited in your success um, uh, with building infrastructure, and I'm probably being generous. Uh, the taking out of the wrong thing is happening a pace around the world. These are my clients in Medellin. Uh, we couldn't convince them to close the freeway uh, that was essentially choking their river and disconnecting it to the downtown. Because they couldn't, it was a federal road and couldn't convince the, con convince the feds. So they convinced the feds to let them build um, a park over top and connect the downtown to the river. My clients in Oslo, before I started working for Oslo, so I certainly don't want to suggest being a part of it, but they closed uh, their freeway. Well, they didn't close their freeway. They buried their freeway, which isn't quite as good, but, but is still good. That disconnected the central area from the fjord, and they've re been redeveloping their fjord remarkably. They closed the, 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 or they buried the freeway. They put it underneath this, and they built a whole urban neighborhood. It's not just this that replaced the freeway. All of this replaced the freeway whole urban neighborhood of office space and housing, et cetera, plus a multimodal boulevard with light rail, with bus-only lanes, with widened sidewalks and separated bike lanes, and car traffic. And they move more people per day now on this than they ever did in the freeway, significantly more. As soon as you realize that the point of all of this is to move people, not cars, then you realize this is success, and the freeway was a failure because it just didn't move enough people, and it could, never could. So I talked about the culture in Vancouver. We call it the years of the warlords, where the decades where the planners and the engineers were in outright battle to, 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 to determine supremacy of City Hall. 
and that's still playing out in many city halls I'm aware of. And that's, that's the extent of my technological ability when it comes to putting together PowerPoints. So I hope you're really impressed by that. You want to see it again? All right, here we go. Oh. I did that 15 years ago and I refused to update it. In the 1990s, oh, see that? See that? The, uh, the transportation director and I used to joke that every day we gave each other a hug. Uh, and he's a big guy, he makes me look small. He was a former professional uh, f uh, offensive line uh, football player. Uh, we, to show our staff essentially that um, uh, every day that that relationship was critical. The 1997 transportation plan was the change in that culture where after a failure of a really bad uh, car-oriented plan uh, was rejected by council, uh, they were sent away to, for planners and engineers to work together, equal numbers on the team, and come up with the transportation plan. And they actually coined the term, which has now become a really popular hashtag on, um, on, uh, on social media, of uh, plan-engineers, the idea that it's one discipline with a common definition of success, which isn't to move people, or certainly not cars, but to build a great city. And uh, that culture has stayed in Vancouver, certainly since the 1990s. One of the most important things the transportation plan did was reject this notion of balance. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you come from a place where there's a policy in your city that speaks to balance ways of getting around, which is considered progressive policy. I call that code for the status quo only slightly better. What we said in Vancouver in the 90s was not balance, prioritization. Uh, walking first, then biking, then public transit, then goods movement, and then the automobile. We rarely ban the car, we just prioritize it last. In, I won't say all of our decisions, uh, Vancouver is certainly not perfect at this. I've seen plenty of evidence that this isn't uh, always applied. Uh, but uh, better than most, the power of that um, uh, policy is significant. But crafting that policy is the easy part. I've now helped several cities around the world put similar policy into their transportation plans and city plans. But this is the truth, and we write policy about this now, which is the truth of a city's aspirations isn't found in its vision or policy, it's found in its budget. It's the disconnect between what you say you want and what you're actually doing, both in your street standards and your rules and regulations, and certainly where your money goes, that really determines the truth of your aspirations. So, um, I've always said every city should have to show when they pass their budget how their budget will specifically implement the policies that they won awards for at planning conferences. Here's another truth, and this is the way I really describe this prioritization, because some try to claim that when you do what, what I'm talking about, it's a war on the car. And it wasn't an American who came up with that, it was Doug Ford, our, our former Toronto uh, mayor, uh, the crack mayor, you remember him? <laughs> Anytime we, we talk about your Trump, we have to remind ourselves about our Doug Ford, or at least Toronto's Doug Ford. Um, if you design a city for cars, it fails for everyone, including drivers. If you design a multimodal city, it works better for everyone, including drivers. This is not a war on drivers or a war in the car. It's an acknowledgement that this is how cities actually work. And anybody who rejects this notion does not understand how cities work or how geometry works. Because if everyone's driving in a finite amount of space, nobody moves well. And certainly not emergency vehicles, freight or, or trucks for economic activity, etc. So when we're designing the walkable city, it's not just the horizontal, it's the vertical, it's the city at eye level at five kilometers an hour, not just retail or commercial, but residential space. No blank walls is our number one urban design uh, principle in Vancouver. And we tend to assume you can only have an active edge if it's a retail street. We don't put retail streets everywhere, certainly not where they don't make sense, but you have to have an active edge. And residential are great active edges, you just have to design them that way. So whether it's retail, whether it's residential, uh, uh, New York City has broken down their, their, their streetscape analysis to an incredibly fine-grained level looking all I, I really admire this structure, but they have very little follow through is my observation. Whereas we weren't nearly this organized, but we've actually got it done with a simple principle, no blank walls. And when we're thinking about streets, the next generation of streets, it's not just about movement. 
not just thinking we've evolved from moving cars to moving people. Streets aren't just for movement. In our transportation plan, our new one, our 2040 plan, which I co-led before leaving City Hall with the Director of Transportation, we talked about streets as placemaking places. Uh, I started to use the term sticky streets to describe the, the, the definition of success that people don't move quickly through the street. They slow down, they linger, they spend time, they people watch, they talk with their neighbors, etc. Patios are one of my favorite things. I made the comment that there wasn't a lot of space for, for patios and, and living and loving on your streets in Portsmouth because of a lot of parking that seemed to be taking up a lot of the street space. So cycling is the second priority. I'm not going to go into detail with that. I haven't seen a lot of evidence that there's a really robust conversation about urban biking in, in, uh, in certainly in New Hampshire. And by the way, the share rows outside do not count as cycling infrastructure. I'll say one thing only. If you're serious about increasing your mode share of cyclists, you have to separate your bike lanes. There's lots of ways to do it. You don't have to do it on every street, just high volume, high speed streets. If you're serious about bike infrastructure, that's what you have to do. Sharrows won't do it. Painted lines won't do it. I'm, again, I'm not dismissing those, but don't kid yourself that you're going to have any serious gains if you're not willing to do what's actually necessary. This was one of our first downtown separated bike lanes. We did it too slow in Vancouver. We did it one bike lane at a time. Uh, I call that pulling the Band-Aid off slowly, politically, because it was incredibly painful. Uh, uh, my former city I planned for Calgary did it better, learning from Vancouver's mistake, and they built a minimum grid pilot for a year, and they turned a, a very touchy political approval of this pilot to a unanimous support uh, to make it permanent. You should look at, if you're interested in bike lanes and, and pilots, look at what Calgary did. Probably the best bike lane pilot I've seen anywhere in North America. Transit is the third priority. I know you don't have technologies in many of your places like this, but I'm a big fan of buses. Buses don't get enough respect. They're flexible, they're cheap. The key is to make them frequent. This is Vancouver's frequent transit network, which means that they run it at least every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and in most cases, less than 10 minutes. And it's all by buses. So uh, you can have a good transit system by buses. It just has to be frequent. And, and consistent. And you have to ask yourself tough questions about whether you're focusing on ridership or you're focusing on coverage and get rid of these kinds of, uh, um, uh, usually these are political decisions to feel like you have to be close to almost everybody's front yard. Uh, if you had unlimited resources, that could work. You don't, and your prioritization should be ridership. So a lot of cities are reorganizing and seeing actual gains in ridership because of that. Uh, follow um, 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 Jarrett Walker in Human Transit to, to learn all about this uh, out of Portland. Okay, thanks. Uh, and cars are last, but cars get a lot of attention in, in Vancouver and other cities, particularly car share. We have the largest car share system in North America. Every car share replaces 20 vehicles taking up space in your urban context. And once you understand that it is fundamentally about space, you realize that um, uh, the critical need to reprioritize space in the context of all of this. We, we see all these kinds of images to make the point that it's about space. And I've been collecting these kinds of things from different cities. I think Munster, um, uh, Germany was the first. This is the latest that I love in Santiago because they made the extra point that when you trap a bus in the same traffic, this is what you're doing. And how fair is that? Really effectively made. Or just whimsical things like pointing out how much less space uh, bike parking takes than car space. The second priority uh, in density done well is consistently high design quality. I've talked about the importance of design quality. But you're not going to scare away value and, and development if you have a consistent and predictable high design quality. Yes, you can do tall buildings in the right places, but it's about how you do tall buildings. And ignore the architecture because I find it boring. But the tower separation, the ability to penetrate in, these are not slab tall buildings. What I find in cities that are afraid of height is they shorten the buildings just tall enough to still be tall, but also really fat and essentially um, devastate that kind of waterfront frontage, for example. 
Uh, it's how they land that matters, though. In Vancouver, they land in a human-scale podium. We invented the podium and point tower, the prototype technology, that cities are now badly copying all over the world. But the point is that the human scale gets determined by the podium. The, the active street edge with a, with a four to six level scale that creates the urban room, the sense of enclosure, sunlight access, etc. And then the towers are separated and thin, not fat, and stepped back and they float out of the perception of the walker, as my predecessor used to say. And we use all that density well, in whatever form it is to pay for many of the amenities that make density livable and lovable that, frankly, our municipality would never be able to afford. Uh, things like our consistent seawall, uh, publicly owned seawall access to the waterfront with a high design quality, uh, that is the, um, uh, one of the, considered one of the best public spaces in the world. We pay for that with density. We pay for all sorts of things with density. Parks and civic spaces and kid-friendly amenities and daycare and heritage preservation and restoration and community facilities, etc. All leverage from density. And we don't buy into scale dogma. Most of places like Vancouver actually prohibit tall buildings. So it's not about saying yes to them everywhere. It's actually about saying no to them in most places. But where you do allow them, you get a high design quality uh, from them. My observation in Port Portsmouth last night is the only design quality conversation that seems to be happening is, is it, does it look like it's an old building? Check. And is it less than five floors? Check. If those two checks are made, then it's high quality. That's not nearly enough in the conversation. And you're focusing entirely too much on how many floors the building has, rather than how buildings are designed well or poorly at every scale. Vancouver does a lot of mid-rise. Uh, but, frankly, our mid-rise is better than most American mid-rise. These are liner shops along our street with a small street front rhythm. The large big box retailer is, it only gets this kind of a cor uh, corner treatment. There's three other uh, recessed uh, uh, mid-size category killer retailers and housing above. It's a vertical power center with housing thrown in and it's in a mid-rise scale. And our Olympic Village, which we built for the 2010 Winter Games, called by the U.S. Green Building Council the greenest community in North America, mid-rise. Uh, but creating great public spaces framed by that mid-rise scale, parks, urban plazas, uh, relearning how to do buildings in a green way, reducing the energy load by 30% through passive design, natural ventilation, passive solar shading, externalization of, of stairwells and, um, and corridors, reduce the energy load by 30%. Rainwater capture, because it's Vancouver and it rains a lot there, but even solar. And the game changer being the district energy system, which only works with a certain density. But that's the reason why we beat every other community in North America from a lead ND perspective and became the greenest. Capturing the waste heat from our sewage system, basically warm poop, and capturing it to uh, warm our, our water and warm our spaces. Largest district energy system in North America by far. But the point is, at every scale, an attention to good urban design relationships. Not about the cost of the materials or the quality of the banister railing. The fundamentals of urban design activating in edge condition public spaces, etc. So when you're talking about the lower densities, uh, what my friend Cal in California, Dan Perola, calls the missing middle, um, it's all those other forms of density and having a conversation everywhere about how these kinds of housing forms actually can stabilize neighborhoods that are losing population because empty nesters are not downsizing. And your threat of your school is, uh, your, th th that your school is going to close, your retail is failing, because your population is actually dropping. If you actually add new housing forms in, you can stabilize your community and return that population. We need a different conversation about the issue of change and so-called stable neighborhoods, which I reject as a concept, by the way, uh, in our lower density communities. In eco-density, I use the terms gentle, hidden, and invisible density and aggressively made the point that there's no such thing as a stable neighborhood because we would describe all the things happening in neighborhoods as population dropped and kids left and your school is under threat of closure and I pointed out does any of that sound stable to you? And we have a conversation about how gentle density which is row houses and duplexes, duplex etc. 
and hidden density, which is laneway housing in the back lane, detached, what you call an ADU, a detached accessory dwelling unit in the, in, in the back, uh, a Fonzie suite, as, as we called it and others have called it. Um, you, you know why, right? Everybody remembers Fonzie above the Cunningham's garage. And invisible density, which is the ADU that we call it secondary suites within the primary home, which I called invisible density because you literally can't see it. It's part of the primary home. All of these ways you can have a conversation about densification that have nothing to do with even mid-rises, let alone high-rises. But you need that conversation everywhere uh, because it facilitates aging in place, integration of keeping seniors in your neighborhood, bringing kids back, et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of conversation and the kind of language you need to come up with so that you can have a conversation about density that isn't just perceived as uh, high rises. And people said to me at the time, why are you putting so much energy into the laneway housing program? Uh, uh, a very small idea an architect told me, I remember distinctly. We have, a, this is out of date, we actually have over 3,500 approved across the city. Uh, a small idea, but a good idea and uh, has transformed the conversation about the, the issue of change within low density neighborhoods. Plus, by the way, Vancouver already allowed secondary suites in the primary home. So we have no such thing as a single detached zone. Our minimum zone allows three units, the primary house, the secondary suite within the primary house, and the separate excess, uh, uh, ADU uh, laneway house in the back. So three units, and only one parking space required for the lot, not the units which is the key to making that idea work. So again, if you think density is easy in Vancouver, this is a typical headline in Vancouver. And this was a poster done by a community group when all we were proposing was to change, because our building codes had changed for stick frame, uh, for wood frame houses, to go from 50 feet to, or 40 feet to 50 feet along a, a transit, frequent transit corridor. And this was it, attack of the 50-foot condos. Normally that gets a laugh. Last night in Portsmouth, I think everybody went, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much normal. It's amazing. Most of the density fights in Portsmouth seem to be about one floor or something. It's remarkable to me. My, one of my heroes, Jonathan Barnett, said it's not how dense you make it, but how you make it dense. I disagree. It's both. It needs to be dense because density does certain things that you need to have happen. But it's how you make it dense that will determine its success, including its political success. We need to get from NIMBY, not in my backyard, to QUIMBY, quality in my backyard. How do we shift the conversation to a conversation about quality? And how does government be able to say in a straight face that you can deliver quality? Do you have the tools, the mechanisms, the culture, the political will? to make sure that you're not just open for business, but you're actually insisting on design quality and value that will actually may be better for business in the short and long term. Now, I'm, I'm basically done, but I'm gonna do a little snap around at the end. As you're doing all of that thinking around how you're planning your permanent city making, I wanna make a point about the fast temporary city making. So there are a lot of really simple ideas out there that we could be doing right now, but it's remarkable how hard we make simple ideas. In the United States, you call it tactical urbanism or lighter, quicker, cheaper. Uh, we call it different things in other parts of the world. But the point is, you can do things fast. My clients in Auckland, New Zealand, uh, Waterfront Auckland, had massive parking lots on their waterfront, literally overnight, created this boulevard to connect the downtown to the place they wanted to start building a new uh, community because they wanted the market to know it was there. They created this promenade, literally, which is planters and paint. Incredibly successful, done overnight. Probably, if it had been approved at all by the city, if it had gone through City Hall, probably would have taken a year. And they did it overnight because they were exempt from the city processes. Food carts, food trucks, in blank spaces and dead spaces, uh, your, sur your sur surface parking lots, etc. any of your dead edges. The debate on these tends to be about the effect they have on restaurants, like that's the only issue. They are a placemaker, they are a gap filler. Another gap filler are container urbanism. This is Helsinki, this is New York, this is, oh no, this is Helsinki, this is Oslo. This is Halifax, Canada. This is Christchurch where I've worked, where they lost 80% of their building stock after the earthquake. They are better at gap filling than any place in the world. And they use container urbanism to do it quite well. 
parklets. If you come from a place that doesn't do these, you should be asking yourself why not. The problem is you have one day called parking day or parklet day where you do some and then it goes away the day after and you have one or two. You should be doing this significantly. Portsmouth certainly should. You've got plenty of parking, too much probably. And you could be using a lot of that space for creating public realm and placemaking for people. And in the meantime, I collect all the little things I see in cities that are just whimsical and fun under hashtag City of Smiles uh, on Twitter and just make the point that we need to sometimes get out of our own way and lighten up and um, have some fun. So I'll stop there and remind you that everything I've talked about is possible where you live. Quit making excuses and focus on the vision, will, and skill to make it happen. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brent. That's, uh, I'm sure, got a lot of you folks thinking, certainly me, I, I think about community engagement, trying to talk about those concepts, economics of development, and just land use regulations that can use density as a way, at least in my world, to try to create affordable housing. We do have some time for about 30 minutes for questions. Um, just to, some of the ground rules for that, because we're in a theater and when you ask your question, be facing forward, it would be great if you could use a microphone. We've got Jane and Heather, so if you raise your hand and Brent will moderate this and answer your questions. Um, we'll try to get to as many as possible, but please do wait for the microphone and, and get it up nice and close so we can hear you. Thanks very much. And if there's any questions, go ahead and raise your hand and, and Brent will... I'd like to go to this gentleman over here first. Excuse me. Because it's a bit of a conversation, you can have some preamble commentary. I'm not going to force you to go right to a question, but the question should materialize fairly quickly. I, I was just going to ask you uh, to elaborate a little bit on leveraging density to pay for other amenities? Uh, American cities do do this. I, w I often find that a lot of my conversations in America run into an ideological wall because it's a sort of a free market, regulation is bad ideology, which is almost uniquely American. The rest of the, the world doesn't think that way. Um, and that's true in terms of things like mandating two and three bedroom units, etc. When it comes to using density bonusing, uh, there are certainly American cities that are doing it. New York's doing it, Seattle's doing it, San Francisco's doing it. I know uh, others that are doing it to a lesser extent. Vancouver does it more than any other city in the world. because I know that because I did a study for Sydney in the updating of their system where we looked at the 10 most prolific cities for using density bonusing or what's often called value capture in the context of things like paying for transit or, or, or what have you. Even TIF to a certain extent is a bit of, uh, of an overlapping mechanism for this kind of thing. But the point is you don't give away your density. Uh, it needs to uh, be earned through great design first of all, but it also needs to contribute to the things that are necessary for that good planning to be successful or that density to be successful. Some um, uh, developers who hate it call it selling zoning. Uh, what I say as a city maker is it's inextricably tied to my willingness as a city planner to support density in the first place because communities can accommodate more density if they have the amenities that actually make that density a good decision from a planning perspective. It's also critical for marketing. The whole point to the marketing uh, of, of urban versus suburban is that if you come into an urban place, the, the critical mass will create the amenities that allow it to outperform in that context compared to the suburbs because the suburbs offer different things. The problem I've observed in America is you deliver the density, but you don't deliver the other things that the marketing promised, often because you can't afford it, because you're not making use of these tools. So the tools like density bonusing or value capture, it's simple, you have a base density, you can go up to a, a uh, a possible density, but the land lift, the difference in value that's created through that political decision, a portion of that goes back into the public coffers to pay for specific things that support that density in the first place. It should never be, um, we call it a nexus, there should always be a nexus between the density granted and the thing that it pays for, so that it, in, with a straight face, you can say this is necessary to make the density supportable. I say that to municipalities because some municipalities want to put it into the coffers to lower taxes or something like that. You cannot do that. There needs to be a direct relationship or nexus or, or the citizens won't allow you to get away with it is my experience. Does that yeah. answer it enough? Yeah. Do you, uh, have you had any professional experience with converting old shopping malls into multi-use <laughs> centers? Well, I showed you one. Um, I showed you one of about 25. Vancouver is the mecca 
Uh, any, everyone know Ellen Dunham Jones in, in, in America? Uh, she wrote Retrofitting Suburbia, great book. Um, almost 40% of her, uh, all of her examples are from Metro Vancouver. Um, you can't swing a stick without hitting a converting mall right now, mostly with transit being the catalyst. The difference between the United States and Canada, amongst a few differences, um, is um, we never overbuilt our retail. We have something like, I think the studies have shown, we have one-fourth the retail per capita that you have. Uh, many cases, your taxation system is, de is determined by, by sales tax revenue and such. So you've massively overbuilt retail, and, you, and your planning systems won't regulate that. So you have a lot more failed malls, right? You have to build a brand new mall right across the road from the one that's going to go out to a business. We don't have that because we never overbuilt malls. But we observed what you started to do with some of your failed malls, and, and we said, well, why don't we do those before the mall fails? For us, it's a challenge of success, not a su challenge of failure. So uh, one of the examples I often show in my talk is the second most successful mall on a sales per square foot basis in, in Canada, called Oak Ridge Mall. And we put a transit station at it, and we started having the conversation with the mall owner about what if you could transform, uh, take advantage of the value proposition of turning it into residential and mixed use, et cetera. And they said, I'm a mall owner. I don't do that. And we said, well, what if we worked with you to figure out how to do it? And we could even play matchmaker with developers. So they did that. They, the, the developer ended up buying out the mall and now owns the mall. And they're going through the process of, of transforming it. Uh, if the value, it, it's usually driven, no pun intended, uh, by something like transit but also by high land values and high um, uh, residential values. So if you've got a housing shortage, that can be enough of a catalyst uh, to start to transform malls. My message to you, based on what we learned from you and then what we did in some ways better, is don't wait for the malls to fail. That means that governments need to proactively go out to successful malls and figure out what the catalyst could be for that kind of transformation, especially the well-located ones. And it usually involves asking them a lot of questions, listening to what it would take to, to transform their thinking, and proactively uh, doing something with them, which is what we did in Oak Ridge Mall in Vancouver. And I'm, I'm setting up that culture and, and that capacity in some cities I'm working with, because what I say is once you get into the infill world, you can't just do what planning departments do, which is put the zoning in place and wait for the application to roll in. It doesn't happen. Uh, even if the mall has failed, often developers don't, it doesn't occur to them that they could build something else, not developers, mall owners, because they think, well, how can I uh, refurbish this mall? I got to spend blank money and, and jazz up the design. They don't think they could transform it. We need planning departments to be proactively going out and educating owners about what's possible and then working with them to make it happen. It's like the combination of planning and economic development, but led by planning because planning knows the right thing to do. Economic, often, economic development often just wants something to happen. So, but all, all of that is proactive. So does that make sense? I could give you a thousand examples of different things. And, and we're doing a lot in, come to, if you're interested in that subject, come to Vancouver and, and ride our SkyTrain around and almost at every stop, you've got them all like that transforming. One up here. Uh, one of the things that uh, many of our communities are seeing, uh, and I think a lot of town councils, planning boards, and planners are, are revering as the silver bullet to fix our zoning and development is uh, form-based code or mm -hmm. character-based code, and just wondering your experience and thoughts on that, because uh, as a planning board member and looking at it as the town looks to embrace this, it seems as though it limits the character that you can create within mm -hmm. your community. Um, I try to spend limited time on debating the tools. Uh, we don't have a lot of form based codes in Canada because we have stronger planning systems. And there's a lot more discretion and negotiation built into our systems. Andre Stwani once said to me, Vancouver doesn't need a form based code because it has an elite bureaucracy who can no negotiate good design. But most American cities uh, don't have that. And so you need to sort of define an answer, especially if you're in a smaller community that doesn't have a lot of professional capacity. 
for, um, for that kind of a negotiation. Um, so I can be sometimes critical of form-based codes. It's as sort of, well, you know, what's the point of a planning department if the code tells me the exact answer? I could have a trained monkey come in and do things. I'm being a bit mean. Um, but what I'd rather ha we use, a, uh, our whole system is based on what's called discretionary zoning, where you have the ability to negotiate good design outcomes. And I had remarkable flexibility as a chief planner, both in Vancouver and, and even in Calgary. Uh, to negotiate better answers, and I trusted my and my staff's ability to know a better answer when they see it, and know a worse answer when they see it. <laughs> so I always prefer that. I like flexibility. Uh, well, what I, I actually like flexibility in some cases and clarity in others, because one of the key purposes of a planning system is to send enough clarity to the marketplace so that land can transact at the right price. Because if you overpay for land, then it's a problem for all of you when people come in desperate to get more density because they overpaid. Which, by the way, is not your problem. It's theirs. That's called speculation. But um, what I, what, I have nothing against form-based codes, particularly in contexts like uh, what you do. And, and if they are based on the right value system, uh, they can be quite good. My problem is I'm not necessarily sure I would agree with most of your form-based codes. Like on issues like height, for example. Because I think a lot of the new urbanist form-based codes are dogmatic about height. I'm interested in the missing middle and mm -hmm. liked your characterization of gentle, hidden, invisible. Mm -hmm. And um, this is specifically in reference to Portsmouth, but I think it actually is a model for many towns and cities in New Hampshire. Is if you had, I mean, what's the threshold for the missing middle to be accommodated in what, in a, like in neighborhoods that people already feel are, are basically built out? You know, do you, do you go and, uh, and basically promote sort of a teardown yeah. rebuild, or maybe along transit lines? Just interested yeah. in your thought, like what's the threshold of I don't change? Know, in I don't think there's, a th there's an answer to that. I think that's what a good planner figures out by listening, reading the political moment, understanding your political support or lack thereof. I'm pragmatic that way. I always, I think one of my skills is to read the moment of what I can get away with in terms of progression towards the right things. I don't mean get away with in a negative way. I mean what I can accomplish politically in the context of what I know needs to be accomplished. And then I add 25% to that because I always figure I should be better at this, and I go further in the moment. But I'm not stupid. If you, do, if, you, if you try to do dumb things because you're just ideological and know it's right, even if you are right and you fail, you can set back the density movement by 10 years. Right? So reading the moment and understanding the context, and it could be a different answer, and it is a different answer in different contexts. But certain things like accessory dwelling units as an as of right uh, in all detached houses is the closest thing to a no-brainer in housing policy. I often say there's, there's probably about 10 things I could list where I say, if you're not doing that, you're not serious. And one of them is, if you're not allowing secondary suites, ADUs, and primary homes because you're worried about the manufactured parking debate, and I've looked at hundreds of parking studies and such relating to the, the question of ADUs and such, and it's a manufactured political debate. Um, if you're not serious, if you haven't done that yet, you're not serious. So that's a no-brainer, whether you do it in the context of a separated ADU, that could be very... Uh, your question about teardown, yes, one of the principles is that over time, when you put things in place, that would create a market incentive for land assembly, and thus the creation of something that's denser. You have to calibrate that relative to your really smart understanding of land economics because you have to be able to break the gravitational pull of the inherent profitability of a single detached house. So you need enough density to break that pull depending on how much your single detached houses are worth. So there's an economic understanding that you need to have, not just a form understanding, right? So all of that happens in the context of a really thoughtful consideration. We tend to not have a thoughtful consideration. It usually tends to be a really simplistic and mostly political discussion and debate, is my observation. Not just in the United States, in Canada, in, in many places. Raise your hand if you're in a city or town that allows accessory dwelling units within um, uh, detached houses. 
Oh yeah, somebody told me that. So not for detached. Not for detached? Just for attached. Well then, it's not. You don't have it because uh, I'm asking you the question about detached houses. Yeah. It does, no, it can be within within the principal house, but. Do your rules and laws allow a homeowner anywhere in the city who is, owns a detached home to do a rentable or what have you, secondary suite or, or, or ADU? Yes, raise your hand. Yes, within the structure. Okay. So that's the law? Okay, okay. Okay, then you, then you get to be progressive, but only because your state forced you to. All right, raise, raise your hand if the only reason your municipality is doing it is because the state forced them to. All right, don't really raise your hand. I don't want to get you into trouble. But <laughs> all of them? Somebody just said all of them. OK. Who's next? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about solutions that you've seen around the world with regard to slowing down traffic on um, you know, what are sometimes termed urban freeways, uh, not actual freeways, but uh, you know, one-way city streets, two lanes that uh, serve to induce fast traffic. Yeah, that's not a freeway if it has intersections, right? I often call them, and if it's just two lanes? Two lanes, one direction. Wow. One-way streets. Yeah. Traffic pairs. Uh, so there's a few ways I can answer that question. I'm not a fan of one-way streets and one-way pairs, especially if it's in your main streets. Um, that's, that means you have, you have a less successful street if, because you have that. Sometimes people point out to me that, well, the, there is a street that's a one-way main street, and it's doing well. And I always say, well, it would be doing better if it were two-way. That's just a fact. Um, but in terms of slowing them down, I, th I thought at first you were asking what happens when you have a state highway or freeway that comes into town and becomes the main street for a little while, and then becomes a highway again. So I'm not sure I f fully know the scenario you're talking about. Well, uh, making it two-way would slow traffic down. We know that. Fr friction and tension does that. Obviously, looking at your lane widths is critical. Often, it's not about how many lanes, but how wide the lanes are. You know, we design it with a design speed of, of, of 80, and then we say you have to drive 50. Uh, or I'm using Canadian uh, uh, things. <laughs> I, I have no idea what that is in miles per hour, because I don't think in miles per hour. Um, but um, uh, design speed is critical, so you look at how many lanes you have, look at how wide your lanes are, look at if there's friction with two-way, friction with cars and parallel parking, which can be a great way to calm down. All of those things slow down traffic without having, ever having to do things like bump outs, which is a more dramatic uh, approach. But yeah, you, uh, especially on a main street, you should desperately be wanting to do that because every study shows that when the traffic is slower, people are more likely to see something in the window stop and shop. So critically important to commercial streets and such. Have I hit your? Yeah, I just didn't know if there were any, any additional ways other than. Well, rumble strips. Um, it, you can do it through materiality. You can do it through um, even things like paint. Uh, if you do a colorful mural on the street, it's actually shown with the exact same material without having to change your material, tear up your street. If you just do it with paint, it's shown that people actually slow down because the automatic human response is that I'm not sure what this is and I have to be careful. You know, all the visual cues that make, ironically, that we have stripped out, often in the name of safety, actually make you speed more and make things less safe, certainly in terms both in frequency and intensity of accidents. So we've got all the studies to show that. The DOTs often don't seem to read those studies, but, um, but that's the truth. We have time for one more question. Even, even frequency of intersections and your block <laughs> patterns can slow down traffic. So there's any number of ways to do it. I like paint lately because it's the easiest one because it's really cheap. Hi, I have a question. Where, where are you? Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> um, can you speak a little bit to how you do density well when you add the element of snow and ice? and what works and, and what doesn't? And is it just fictitious that we think we can't do bike lanes and different things in the snow? Um, maybe you can speak to that. Well, there's a lot of uh, snowy cities that are dense 
So I'm um, almost wondering if it's a trick question. Um, I, I, I probably don't understand the underlying premise that, that I would have any different basic high-level philosophy in terms of density done well. There, you know, Canada is almost entirely a winter country. Vancouver has the least amount of snow, but we're, we're, we're a dense country in many ways. Um, more specifically, you get into issues like road widths uh, for snow storage or, or sea of parking out there where the claim is that it's not just for the parking on Black Friday, it's for the snow storage all year. And if you actually have those scenarios, it can push you towards unfavorable conditions like too much parking, too wide roads, etc., where you're where they promote speeding during the summer because you've made them too wide to address the winter. What I would like is for cities to get to a point where if it has to be wider um, in the winter because of snow storage, there is a simple way to retrofit it during the summer so it isn't wider in the summer. And for parking, for example, in your, in your surface parking lot, when you don't need it for snow storage in the winter, it gets automatically converted to a farmer's market or something like that in the summer. We need to, because there are public benefit reasons to reducing it so you don't have things like speeding and such. So I would like a much more, because what usually gets told to me by usually traffic engineers at the municipal level is, Brent, it has to be this fill in the blank, wide, big, many, uh, because of winter and snow storage. Uh, okay, so let's have a conversation about how to accommodate, accommodate that when it's needed in the winter and has a different, simple, cheap design approach in the summer when it isn't needed. But that's only a couple of things that are really driven by s snow and ice specifically and mostly related to transportation and roadways, although also sidewalks and such. But it doesn't change my inherent message, any of my messages around density in a general sense. Unless I'm missing something in the nuance of your question. I think a lot of developers, um, they don't want to add things because winter is just a, you know, a large part of our year. What do you mean um, add things? Uh, people always say, oh, the snow is going to take up that space or it's, it's going to cost so much. Uh, the plants are going to die. Well, they might in the winter. <laughs> Plants die in the winter sometimes, or they, they go to sleep, so to speak. So what we need to be better at is, is snow storage in places like landscaped areas, where it's OK to put snow on landscaped areas because they might even get replanted, or, or they're hardy enough to handle it and survive and go dormant until the summer. But then when the snow goes away, it's not a hardscape asphalt. It's a nice thing, right? So you don't ignore snow. You know. Uh, Canada does more so-called winter cities planning and design than most places, but it doesn't mean you're defaulting to dumb solutions all year round. You just have to be a little more intelligent and think in terms of seasonal solutions. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Brent. My pleasure. Uh, we really appreciate it.